Jared Adams, Dale Vante, Richard Baker, Joseph Sandrowski, Rico Daniels, Michael, <coughs> Mark Kirscher, Ethan, Samuel Odom, David Ramirez, Kyle Winkleman. All right. <coughs> What I like to do is I like to go back and review the most important points from last time. Um, review some of the terminology and make sure that we understand the process correctly. Uh, my expectation is that uh, I hope that between last week, not last week, last class and today, you're able to go and install the JDK on your particular machine uh, and in lab even to try it. Uh, so it's good if you can work on it both in lab and in your own machine, on your own machine. So you shouldn't have had to install it on the machine upstairs. It should already be installed. Uh, you would probably need to install it on your machine at home, but to understand the procedure to do it. You need the JDK and not the JRE. All right, the JDK is a developer's kit. The JRE is simply the runtime engine. So the runtime engine is simply for people that want to run Java programs, but not necessarily create them. All right, the difference between them, in a nutshell, would be, and if you notice that the file sizes, it's, it's a huge difference. It's like the JRE is like a meg, I think, and the, the JDK is like a hundred some meg. But with the JDK, you get the compiler so that you can compile the code. You also get the Java libraries framework so that you can build your code based on the pre-written classes that exist in Java. With the JRE, the runtime engine, essentially you get the Java virtual machine for running. So JDK is for creating Java programs and running. The JRE is just for running. And for this class, we need the JDK. A key thing, especially on Windows, is to make sure that you have your path set. That hangs a lot of people up. Most people that install it, if they've installed the JDK and it still doesn't work, it's probably because you didn't set the path correctly. So I'll tell you that right now. All right. Uh, that would be like the first thing I ask you if you were to email me and say, hey, I installed Java and I still can't do this. It'll be, it'll be that. Yes. That is a good question. Uh, it has been so long since I have done it, installed it on a Mac, that I do not recall. It seems to me that you don't. It seems to be like it automatically sets it. But I could be wrong. All right. So I talked, I used the word compile. And again, I want to review what that means. You start off with your Java source code, which will be one or more .java files. This is source code, meaning that it is code that people can write and read and understand easily. The machine can't directly execute source code, however. It has to go through a process called compiling. All right. So this is the code that you will look at and be working on. In order for you to run that code, you have to go through the process of compiling, which is done via the Java C command. And that will produce one or more .class files. And that can be run by typing in Java, which invokes the Java virtual machine and allows you to run your program. So let's repeat that this time in class with the Hello World, and then we'll go to an enhanced version of the Hello World application.
All right. Um, here's the Hello World program. I will copy it. Go into Notepad++. I'll paste that in. It should be saved in a file called hello-world.java. How do I know that? Well, I know the first part of it should be hello world because that's the name of, a, of the class. Remember, the name of the class is the first part of the name of the file in which you store the source code. And with only a few exceptions, there should be one class per file. Right now, we're not going to have any exceptions. All right. Later on in the semester, there'll be some exceptions. One file, one source code file per class. And the class's name in this case is Hello World. All your code's going to appear in some class somewhere. So we're going to go and save this. And I'm going to make it easy on myself and create a folder for it. Java, and I will go and save this in that folder. I hope this is largely review for you. But I want to make sure you got this down, because if you don't have this down, then you're going to struggle with everything else we do. So, our source code is in the folder that I saved it. We'll look at the details of the source code in a minute and review those. I'm going to go and compile it and run it. I'm going to do all this from the command prompt. And if you're unfamiliar and you haven't used the command prompt for a while or at all, it'll take a little getting used to, but it's really not that hard. The main commands that you need are cd to change directories, dir to list directories, and um, java c to compile, and java to run. If you do store something on your thumb drive, and it's, for example, drive e, you can type in the drive name colon to move to that drive. All right. I'm already on drive C, and that's where my code is, so I don't need to do that. But if it was on drive E, you'd type in E, go to that drive, and then you could type in the CDs to get to the directory that you want to be. Every now and then, it's good just to type in CLS just to clear the screen so that you start with a fresh screen, because sometimes it gets confusing. So my folder is in my user directory. The user in this machine is LCCC Lab on the desktop folder, and in a folder that I call Java. How do I know that that's right? I can do a DIR directory listing. Now I can see there is my source code. I'm going to clear the screen. To compile it, again, you type in Java C, hello world, dot Java. It'll do its thing. If it compiles without any errors, it simply pops up at the prompt. All right? So don't be alarmed if it doesn't show you anything. That's good news. All right? It means it compiled correctly without errors. In a minute, I'll make a few errors on purpose just to show you how the errors appear. If the Java is created by sort of hardcore programming type people, which means that their verbal communication skills might not be up to where we would like them to be. So some of the error messages that it gives you can be a little bit obscure. So it takes a little while to learn, sort of, and to understand, translate the error messages into something intelligible. But I'll go and I'll make some errors on purpose 
just to show you the kinds of errors that you get and help you in troubleshooting them. Now that I compiled it, if I do a directory listing, I see the two files there. I see not only hello world.java, but hello world.class. That is the byte code. This code could be sent to any machine that has a Java virtual machine, and you'd be able to run it on it, which is good. This is, you know, in theory, all right, you can compile once and run anywhere. So I could take this and put this on my Mac, and it would work, or I could put it on a Unix machine, and it would work, as long as I had the Java virtual machine. So you run typing in Java and the name of the class, and you don't need the dot class file here. And there it runs it and gives you a message, hello world. All right? So there you go. OK, let's make some errors on purpose. Now that we understand that process, all right, let's look at the code. We'll analyze the code, and then we'll make some errors on purpose. Remember a couple things. Number one, all your code is going to be inside some class. All right. In this case, we have a very small program. There's only one class. But it will be in a class file. You declare a class by saying the word public. Typically, your classes will be public. The word class, that does, that's what designates it's a class as opposed to some other things that it could be. Then the name of the class. The standard is, is that the name of the class, the first letter of each word is capitalized. So in this case, the name of the class is Hello World. Therefore, the class name would be capital H, capital W. That's the name of the class. That's the name of the file. All right. Windows is less case sensitive than other operating systems, but it's good that you yourself enforce and be case sensitive. So. Call it Hello World with a capital H and a capital W. At least one of your classes within an application will contain a public static void main method. Method and functions are, uh, are pretty much synonymous. All right? So you will need one of your classes to have that main method because this is the method that gets everything started and gets the ball rolling. It's sort of the boss, the overseer, that runs and uses the other classes, even if there are multiple classes, in performing the job. So at least one of your classes will have this, public static void main bracket bracket. And then all the good stuff of what the program consists of will be between those two brackets or braces. There are also braces for the entire class. Notepad++ is good because it color codes so that you can, at a glance, see if your braces line up. Like, I expect this brace to line up with this brace. But maybe if I have an extra brace in here, and I put my cursor next to that. It doesn't show me another brace that it corresponds to. That's sort of a visual cue that you did something wrong. And you can use that to figure out what brace belongs with what. One of the most manning errors that you get is where it says that it expects a brace or uh, too many braces or whatever. You can really help alleviate those errors just by making sure that you've properly indented and, 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 and so on with your code. Make sure your code is neat and easy to read. So all the stuff that's within the class I have indented. All the stuff that's within this method I have indented. So I can tell at a glance, yeah, the braces look like they're correct. And I can verify that. Public static void main, we're not going to go into the parts of that. We're just going to, for now, trust that we understand what that means. And the program that gets the ball rolling is going to have that. And then enclosed in here is going to be your actual stuff. Comments can be done two ways. Multiple comments can start with a slash star and then with a star slash. Single line comments have the double slashes. 
really there's only one line of actual code in this, and that is system.out.println, which is a command that allows you to send to the, to the standard output, in our case, the, the, the terminal window, the command prompt window, some sort of message. And in this case, it's simply system out println hello world. So it's going to output that to the terminal window. Questions about any of this? Now, what about errors? Errors happen a lot of different ways. All right. One of them is with case sensitivity. If I would have a lower case with that S for system and say system out dot print ln, Java's not going to recognize that because the class that does the printing is called the system class with a capital S. And therefore, if I use a lowercase s for system, it's not going to know what that is. Let's see the error message that it gives us. One thing you could do, by the way, that, that makes it useful, especially when you're debugging code, is you can use the arrows to bring back previous commands. So I typed in Java C hello world dot Java a few minutes ago. I don't necessarily want to type that in again. If I use the up arrow, it scrolls me through the commands that I've executed. So once you get into a groove, you know, you don't have to type the commands in over and over again. You can just use the arrows to get to Java C and so on. Okay. In this case, it gives you an error message that is a little bit descriptive, but not completely descriptive. It would great, be great if the error message simply said, you forgot to capitalize the word system. Unfortunately, that's not the way that the Java language error messages work. They're very mechanical. Remember, it's a machine that's doing the checking for you. All it knows is it doesn't know what the word system means. So therefore, it tells you that it doesn't exist. So here's a tip off. If you get an error message telling you something like system doesn't exist, but is something that you know should exist, it very likely could either be that you've slightly misspelled it or maybe you haven't capitalized it correctly. So you can correct it by, oh, system doesn't exist, what does it mean? Look up my example, oh, system needs to be capitalized. You can change it, save it, and then again use the arrow keys to compile it. Pull up the old command and run it, okay? If you forgot and put an extra brace there, it tells you that it expects a class interface or enumeration. That's kind of confusing. Whenever it says that it expects something, it will point to the line, in this case it's line 26, and it consists of that curly brace. Another way of saying that it expects this is that it didn't expect this. So you have to kind of think like the compiler. Why didn't it expect a curly brace? Well, because you already have enough curly braces with this one. This goes with that, that goes with that, and so on. So if it tells you it, expect, it, it expected something else, it didn't expect that brace, which could very well mean that you are missing, or you have one too many braces. And you can go save that. and recompile it, and it's good to go. What if you forget a brace? It 
it tells us that it reached the end of file while parsing. Again, not terribly descriptive. So what? It reached the end of the file. Well, it reached the end of the file when it wasn't expecting to. Why was it not expecting to? Because it was expecting something else. What was it expecting? Well, what's it likely to be expecting? It's likely to be expecting another curly brace. So in this case, that also says, not that you have too many braces, but you have not enough braces. It'll take you some time to, to get these error messages. All right? So challenge yourself. If you get an error message, you can always Google it. You can always ask me. But the hope is, is as the semester progresses, you'll start to recognize the error messages on your own. All right? So at first, it might be tricky, but it'll come. Any questions about this? Let's look at a different version of this Hello World app, one that maybe is a little more relevant to your first assignment. And we'll take a look at your first assignment. I'll get rid of the old version. Well, I'll do this instead. I'll call this one Java 2. And I'll put that in there, and I'll edit it. Notice the class name is Hello World, therefore, I should rename this to be Hello World. The dash one is something that Canvas inserted to not have duplicate file names. Okay, so now I'll go and edit this. Now notice this. This is a little different, but let's check its behavior. Let's look and see how it acts differently than the Hello World original app we had. All right. I'm going to start another command prompt. CD to desktop. CD to Java 2. There's my mistake. Occasionally, you'll see me in class use Unix commands instead of DOS commands. Uh, LS is a Unix command. So let's go and compile this hello world. And let's run it. says, hello, Joyce. Let me run it again. Hello, Mike. Run it again. Hello, Jerry. Hello, Jerry again. Hello, Mike. And so on. It randomly picks a name from a list of names. So this is similar to your first assignment. Your first assignment is to make a Mad Lib. All right, what's a Mad Lib? It's where you take a poem or a nursery rhyme or something, and you fill in words randomly. With an actual Mad Lib, you'd like ask people, like, name an animal, and they might say goat or something like that. And then you'd fill that in in the rhyme, like Mary had a little goat. Here we're going to give you a random list. So you'll come up with a list of five animals or something. And then when you run it, the Java program will choose randomly from those five animals and display Mary had a little fox, Mary had a little goat, Mary had a little kitten, and so on down the line. All right. 
<coughs> so let's look at the source code for this. Basically, it's the same with just the randomization part built into it. All right, what do we have here? What does this look like? An array. What is an array? How would you define an array? A collection, a list, a group of items. Typically, a variable could only have one value, right? If I created a string variable. Again, think back to C sharp. Same idea here, all right? If I had a string variable, it could only have one value at a time. If I have an array va value variable, though, it can contain several values. And I specify which one through the use of what's called a subscript. All right? Now, the subscripts start with zero. So. Mike is names sub zero. Joe is names sub one. Jerry is names sub two. Joyce is names sub three. And the way you write that is if I wanted to refer to Mike, I would refer to name sub zero. Oops. All right. If I wanted to refer to the value of names that was in the position I, all right, if I was an integer, I could say names sub I. And that would print out whatever was in position two, which is actually, remember, the third item on the list, because position zero, position one, position two. All right. So what do we have here? I have a string array, a list, that consists of these four elements, element zero, element one, element two, and element three. All right. I'm then going to create a random variable, all right? This variable is going to be randomly assigned. I first have to declare the variable, and I can say int random. That's a declaration. It means that the variable that I'm declaring is going to contain integers, all right? And the name of the variable is random. I actually could have done this on its own, like this, and do this, spread this between two lines. Where I declare an integer, and then I set the value of that integer equal to this expression. I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with with um, assignment statements from C Sharp, the way the assignment statement works is the right-hand side of the expression gets evaluated, and the result of that gets put in the variable that's put on the left side. So I'm going to evaluate this expression, and I'm going to put the result in this variable random. The other way I did it, again, if I want to, I can just do things in one statement. This statement is equivalent to these two statements. I declare the, the, the variable, and at the same time, I assign it a value. Well, let's work out this expression, and let's do it from the inside out, all right? I 
I say my variable random equals math random times 4. Okay? So, I want to randomly pick one of these elements. That means I want to pick either element 0, 1, 2, or 3. So the first thing I do is math.random. Now, as you can probably guess, I don't have any classes named math, right? The only class I have is a single Hello World class. Therefore, math is a class that's built into the Java framework. And it has a, ran a function called random, which generates a number from 0 to point nine 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 repeating forever. So from zero to almost one, but not quite one. So if I have a number that could go from zero to 0.999 repeating, what do I get if I multiply that by 4? Well, if I multiply the low end by 4, what do I get? 0. If I multiply the high end by 4, what do I get? This is almost 1, right? So if I multiply almost 1 by 4, I get almost 4. Or, in other words, 3.999 repeating. Okay? So, this part of the expression is going to give me a number from 0 to 0.9 repeating. If I multiply it by 4, I'm going to get a number from 0 until 3.9 repeating. All right? What do I do here? I cast it as an int. All right? Now, when I cast it as an int, it truncates any decimal points. It's not going to round it. So, in other words, if I get rid of the decimal points here, when I'm done, random is going to have from 1 to 3, only integers. So when I'm done with this statement, Random gets a value of either 0, 1, 2, or 3. Is that clear to everyone? Okay. So now what do I do? I system out print ln hello, and I concatenate on a value from the array, from the names list, and what subscript do I want? I want the one whose value is in random. OK? Which could be 0, 1, 2, or 3. Could it ever be something that's not in the array? Could it ever be a 5? No, not the way that this is set up. Now, there is a little problem with this code. All right? Not necessarily now, but what if I changed the code? Could anyone think of a way that I could make a change to this that would break this program? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Well, you're right. That wouldn't break it, but 
it would no longer randomly pick it. So if I added Alice onto the end here, it wouldn't break it in the sense of I, I get an error. It would break it in the sense that Alice would never show up. So I'm not really generating a random number from that list. All right? So, don't believe me? Could do this all day. And I'm not getting Alice. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll have more opportunity to break it. That's one way to break it, right? Why does that break it? Well, because this value is only going to be 0, 1, 2, or 3. It's never going to have a value of 4. So poor Alice never gets picked. Okay. What will be another way to break it? Yeah, if you took two names out. Why does that break it? Right. Because I'm going to be looking for something um, random potentially has a value of 0 through 3, and the array only has values 0, 1, and 2. So it might not blow up the first time, but at some point, it's likely that it will blow up. So, worked once. Second time, ah, third time is not the charm, and it blows up, because it tried to pull the fourth person. And it got an error. How do you suppose I could fix this? Pardon me? Add a name back in. Pardon me? Okay, very good. Really, ideally, remember, when you, when you change a program, you want to make changing a program as easy as possible. So, if I added a name, if I added two names, if I added ten names, if I took away two names, whatever, all I should have to do is take away or add those names, and the program should work. All right? What's keeping the program from work, from working, when I add or get rid of a name? I'm multiplying it by four, no matter what. So, if I change something up here, I have to change that there. Guess what's going to happen over time? You're going to forget that you or someone is going to forget to change it. And what if this wasn't a list of four things where the air showed up easily? What if it was a list of 100 things where you could test it 60 times and get a correct answer, but there was a potential that one out of 100 times it would give you an air? All right? Instead of four there, what would it be better to do? I think you alluded to that. Well, if I put a three in there, I have the same problem, just with... Right. The way to do it is to look for an attribute on the array object, or the array class, that contains how big the array is. So, let's look. How do I tell a Java array length? A length to tell the length of the array. str.length. So I could change this to say my array 
which is names dot length. Is that no, why not? Okay, pardon me? The length of one, right. So in other words, I want to multiply it by, no, that is correct. Yeah, it is correct. It does. But remember, we're truncating off any decimals. So it would go to three. It would go to 3, all right, but if I multiply, the highest that math random is going to get is 0 0.999. So if I multiply 0 0.999 by 3, I'm going to get 2.9999. If I try multiples, I have 2. So it will convert the 3 to a 2. Yes? It, it does. Let's follow this through. Make between 0 and 0.99, all right, which means that if there are three names in this, that if I multiply 3 by math random, I get a number from 0 to 2.9999. And when I truncate off the decimals, I'll have a number from 0 to 2. Okay, so that take care of it. So let's test. I have three values like Joe and Jerry. Let's go and save this. Oops. Let's go save this. Compile. Mike, Joe, Mike, Mike, Joe, Jerry. If I really wanted to test it, maybe I'll put that statement in a loop to do it a thousand times and see if it ever blows up, right? But I'm confident it works. Let's go in and let's add fourth name on it. one of the four names each time. Joyce, Mike, Mike, Jerry, Jerry, Joe, Joyce. So that works and that makes the program a lot better. Generally speaking in programming, when we say one program is better than another, uh, we mean a couple of different things. One of the things that we typically mean is that it's easier to make changes to. The first version of this program that I had, if I wanted to change the number of people in the list, I had to make two changes. All right, I had to change that. I had to change the list and either add or get rid of a person. Then I had to change the number four to some other number. This one is objectively better because to change the number of people on the list, all I have to do is add the person to the list. I don't have to touch anything else about the code and it's good to go. Okay? Now, how does it relate to your first assignment? It relates because your first assignment is to create a map your job redefine list of words. For example, move Mary, Lamb, and Fleece and substitute records to come up with rabbit. I think I omitted some of the rest of it. Make sure you at least three words. words. You, should, you should just be able to add to the array. So I should, I should be able to add an item to 
my list of list of my list of names, and when it runs it, it automatically goes and adjusts it. So really, is just a, an expansion of the exercise we did, uh, the example we did today in class. Any questions? Question. Exactly. Yeah, a list of a list of three or four things, and it actually could be a different number for each list. You could have two in the name list. You could have five in the animal list. And you would do that by just, by just yeah creating the list. One list would have one list would have four, and so on. You'd call them all different. Na maybe one could be names, but the other would be animals, the other would be colors, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then you'd say name length, colors length, animals length, and so on. You have a different random number for each of the lists. Other questions? All right, remember we do not have, yes. One thing that, that a lot of people um, get a little confused of in this class is initially we're going to be hard coding stuff. I know in other programming classes, you know, they tell you, no, no hard coding, allow input. You don't have to allow for input in, in this class. We will get GUIs where you can do input, all right? But initially, we're just interested in developing classes that work. This one is just sort of a groundbreaker to make sure you know how to create a source file, compile it, run and get the results, and that you have sort of the basics of Java that down. But when future things come, we're going to hard code our test cases instead of allowing the input for data. Other questions? All right, that's all I had. We'll see you upstairs.